Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today. And we've got a wonderful guest with us, Mr. Nick Thomas, the, I call him the astronaut wrangler, but he's the chief educator for over 30 years. He's been at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. Nick, great to see you, my friend. Good to be back. Thank you. Well, great to be back. Nick's been doing some Stay Curious episodes with us, uh, and we've talked, uh, had a lot of fun talking about some of the stories he has about astronauts and his in-depth knowledge of the space program. And today is, in my opinion, a great anniversary that any space geek ought to know, February 20th, 1962, Nick. America's first manned orbital space flight with John Glenn on board Friendship 7 and a mission that completely turned us around as far as our space program was concerned, and very importantly, turned it around as far as public opinion across the world was concerned. We'll talk about that later. Good. Well, you and I were teenage, teenagers. No, well, kind of. No, we were I, young. We're baby I, boomers, I, I was going to say. I was less than a teenager. I was eight years old and uh, <laughs> actually uh, got a little story I'll tell about my seeing this launch and then not seeing another launch for over 60 years almost later. But 61 years ago... And you better believe it, John Glenn became a hero to lots of boys and girls out mm -hmm. there. Absolutely. And I was one of them, for darn sure. Absolutely right. It was one thing that we had uh, front and center on our minds for all that time. And after the splashdown, after the successful conclusion of the mission, I mean, everyone was absolutely joyous over the success of this thing. And there was a feeling abroad that we were well on our way to eventually landing a man on the moon. Yes, and... and uh, uh, played out in uh, the three TV stations, newspapers of the day were king, mm -hmm. and everybody ran this picture on February 21st of the Atlas uh, rocket with John Glenn in that little, they called them capsules then, and then yeah. we call them spaceships today. Yeah. But uh, So we're going to get into that with Nick here in a minute, but we want to thank everyone for watching Stay Curious. Uh, it's an exciting week as we're going to have a crude launch this weekend, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Marty's pointing out that we've got some noise uh, to adjust. That's all right. We'll just let that. Okay. I think that'll work out there on my back. Our green screen's having a little. I think that's just the heat of that exhaust out of those r engines on those three engines there, <laughs> maybe, Marty. But uh, no, we appreciate everybody uh, l launching here. I actually have the button that launched John Glenn. This is one of our treasures here in the American Space Museum. T.J. O'Malley actually pushed that. Uh, and uh, I've, I've been told many stories about other engineers wanting to dig that out of the control panel there. And uh, we ended up with it. Just one of the amazing things we have here, as Nick, as you know, well know, you'll I challenge any museum to have so many one-off kind of artifacts here. Absolutely. And a lot of one of a kind. A lot of stories out there about T.J. O'Malley, too. <laughs> yeah, we'll be doing T.J. O'Malley Day one day. Nick and I are talking about doing some uh, programs for you all out there. Uh, but we're very grateful for you all and the interest for Shuttle Fest 2. We're going to start building. Mm -hmm. We're going to have an event every April, around April 12th, when the first shuttle was launched. And this year, we're going to focus on the mobile launch platform, too. The date is set, April 15th, out at the Hyatt Place, which is right by 405, going into Kennedy Visitors Complex, where they're building the new bridge. And that's going up quick. Yeah, it's going up rapidly. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we hope that you can make some time to, to uh, come and have a nice vacation time. That's the week after Easter, by the way. So you'll be hearing more about that. And we'd like to thank Delaware North for sponsoring Nick Thomas on our Stay Curious segments from time to time. Delaware North, of course, is the management firm of the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. And that's my way of, of showing, uh, uh, of, of saying, you know, we're grateful for all they do. And uh, Nick, I'm going to do a little bio of Nick here. He's been a communicator for over 30 years. And he's brought education, enlightenment, and your love for space to daily guests at this visitor's complex. You probably can't count the millions of people that you have introduced astronauts in front of. Nick joined the team at the visitor's complex in 87 and stayed on board through many of the incarnations. Of course, Delaware North is, uh, and we think they do a good job, in my opinion, keeping things very clean and up to date. I, and, think, uh, I think more importantly, the great thing that Delaware North does out there is they truly understand the balance between being an attraction 
and being a repository of this nation's history. And they take that role very, very seriously. We just finished about a four-month-long refurbishment of the external fuel tank and solid mm -hmm. rocket boosters outside of the uh, Atlantis exhibit, a thorough inspection and refurbishment inside and out. And uh, we're getting ready to uh, start doing some uh, upgrades on our rocket garden. So Delaware North takes very seriously our position as the world's repository of uh, this great and grand history that we're privileged to have. And attendance seems like is setting records. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have any data from the marketing or the numbers people or anything like that. But just from boots on the ground, it seems to me that we are back to pre-COVID attendance levels. Mm -hmm. yeah. You should have been out there last Friday yeah. on uh, Field Trip Friday. Oh, yeah, field Your trip colleague, Friday. Mark, Mark Smith, had, had, <laughs> he was about had enough. He's ready to get out of there today, I think. <laughs> But uh, Nick's many duties out there are uh, is the astronaut encounter, which is a very popular uh, event twice a day. Uh, an astronaut talks about his his journey to space. Uh, I call Nick the astronaut wrangler out there, supervising these public talks and, and autograph sessions. And uh, we, uh, Marty and I, actually had had dinner with Charlie Walker last night, and we taped a program that you're going to hear with astronaut Charlie Walker this Wednesday. And uh, he was thoroughly had four days and did not I'm say he had enough, but boy, it, it, it's uh, uh, that people you get they're, they're very involved with the public. Yeah, absolutely. from when they hit the place. Absolutely. And, uh, and here you are talking with uh, wonderful Wendy Lawrence. Mm -hmm. There's Marty yeah. getting an autograph from Wendy there at the autograph session at the gift shop. And then they do another one after the four o'clock talk. Mm -hmm. uh at the uh underneath atlantis so uh, yeah very popular boy there was a long line today for uh winston scott winston i had to scott, go out and see right. him mm -hmm. uh, actually taking him some swag wasn't getting an good. autograph actually taking winston something taking he wants some for a display good good but uh very busy on this uh president's day today yeah <clears throat> john glenn day out there so uh and one of the fun things that uh, you get to do is take pictures with the astronaut everybody yep. wants that and uh, it's evolved from uh, we use film cameras uh, to these uh, pocket cameras there, little digital cameras now. And uh, it was remarkable because I, I kind of I was more or less thrown into the role of photographer when this thing started, <laughs> and so I had to learn these cameras just by handling them. And afterwards, discovering that most of the cameras had similarities, and I could kind of tie those similarities into whatever camera I was using. The most unusual camera, most remarkable camera I've ever I was ever handed, was a Hasselblad. Oh my gosh! Like and, it was on the moon. Folks. Yeah, exactly. And I held that thing in my hands, and I took that picture, and I handed it back to that guy as quick as I could because I did not want to take any chance that that thing would slip out of my hands. Yeah. Well, uh, that's yeah, that's cool. Of course, there's like a bunch of Hasselblad cases mm -hmm. and, and lenses on the on the moon there. And our good friends, the UCAC brothers, have used Hasselblad yep. to take their shuttle shots that we share quite frequently. And uh, what, I did want to give a shout out uh, 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 to astronaut Bruce Melnick, who's over the mm -hmm. astronaut encounter, yep. uh, sort of your boss, I yep. guess, in a way. And uh, uh, he's really doing a great job. And, and uh, you know, you've got a lot of he, he's lining them up in quarters, I understand, about a quarter at a time you're getting yeah. them lined up. And, and I will uh, I will tell you, uh, just as a little bit of a, a hint for the future. This coming May, we're going to have a very famous Canadian astronaut with us for, for the first time. I'd say it might be Chris Hadfield? No. No? <laughs> You'll have to come and Okay, find well, out. you bet me well there. Canadian astronaut, yeah. Marty. Yeah. Get your book. Or it's not Chris Hadfield. He's talking about somebody older. Well, we'll, we'll tend to that. Uh, uh, we've got, uh, uh, well, anyway, it's just, if you're here, plan your vacation. There you might be going to the attractions just 50 miles from us yeah. here. The, it is so worth the money to see uh, the reveal of Atlantis. I was yeah. standing in line today with some uh, people that were from Pennsylvania. And I said, have you seen Atlantis? And they said, oh, my gosh, the hair stood up on my arm. Absolutely. And I said, I've seen it 20 times and the hair stands it's up still on my arm. And even for astronauts who've flown on board that vehicle and seen that reveal multiple times, it is still yeah. a gut thumper in a very it good is. way. And, and really you and I have been in the theater. I've yep. never seen anything. You're in a room and everything about the shuttle's history and then welcome home, Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And 
and uh, it's projected on a wall, and then I'll just have to come and be thrilled about and it. And after the reveal, what I'll do is I'll step out to the left and I'll turn and I'll watch the reaction to people as they walk into the hall because yeah. that's the. Yeah. And we could talk about that a lot, but you could probably get mm, five or six of these uh, Mercury capsules in that payload bay of the oh, shuttle with, without the, the escape tower, of yeah. course, on there. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about is uh, Nick Thomas, my hero. Uh, uh, Mr. John Glenn, by the way, we just thank Delaware North for their support and uh, uh, and also for what they do uh, to bring these astronauts in because I'm sure it's not uh, inexpensive putting them up in a nice hotel and their stipend and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we'll talk about that, which you can one day. Of course, our museum, Nick, founded on the handprints of the Mercury astronauts. Gemini and Apollo. This is our Mercury Monument out at Space View Park on the Indian River. To my right of the, or to the right of this is just 10 miles away are the great launch pads of Cape Kennedy and Cape Canaveral. And this is the only place, one of two places in the world I know you can put your hands on the great man. He actually, uh, this is a bronze statue. There's over 30 astronauts in bronze over there. The other place is LBJ's oh, ranch, yes, Nick, where right. he had these freedom stones where everyone put their handprints in cement. And I've seen those, the, the uh, Gus, Shepard, and, and uh, uh, John Glenn went out there after his three orbits. Mm -hmm. And I've actually seen those there at LBJ Ranch. Uh, which uh, don't ever take a uh, miss a chance to go see that in Sweetwater outside of Austin. You and I grew up with that swimming pool and everything mm -hmm. during the Vietnam era. So uh, tell us what John Glenn is famous for before he, and probably what really got him chosen as an astronaut. We're looking at uh, a, a beautiful aircraft known as the F-8 Crusader, the last of the gunships. And John Glenn used this aircraft to establish a transcontinental record from coast to coast uh, in a program called Project Bullet. And uh, that brought him a good deal of fame and a good deal of visibility. Um, it, I don't think it led to him necessarily being an astronaut, but it certainly didn't hurt. I mean, to have a program like that that Glenn planned from start to finish, all the aspects of it and so forth, and flew the mission. So to have a, a gentleman who is capable of that kind of uh, planning and execution for a high-level program with that, like that, I think certainly stood well on his resume, uh, along with his combat record in uh, uh, Korea. Absolutely, right. his combat record in uh, it's very stellar. Marty, can you see say how many hours he did it? I think it's like six hours. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and that's my way of saying hi to Marty Winkle, our co-producer here. Uh, yeah, three hours and eight point four seconds. Wow! Oh, wow! Mm -hmm. Yeah, three hours. Yeah. And, and what what year is that? Nineteen fifty. Move your head a little bit, so I can read oh. it better. Oh, three hours, twenty three minutes, eight point four seconds. And I forget exactly when that was. Nineteen fifty eight or something like yeah, that. Like late fifties. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but John Glenn here he is, our hero. Uh, of course, we're celebrating the what we call MA6 flight, and then uh, years later at age 77, I guess 37 years later, because mm -hmm. he was 40 when he flew this, he returned to space for 10 days. On uh, everyone knows it's STS 95, and and uh, uh, and but he had you know 10 days in space up there, uh, and at that time, the oldest man in space. You know, what's remarkable, we, we talk about all the records he broke between Friendship 7 and STS uh, uh, 95, and how much STS 95, how much discovery was larger and better, and so forth. Right, but here's an unknown fact John flew. 14 miles per hour slower on board Discovery than he did on Friendship 7 because Discovery's orbit was a few miles higher. Really? And the higher orbit is always a slower orbit. That's interesting. So That's he lost he lost 14 miles per hour, oh shucks. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. I went faster, my speedier Mercury <laughs> capsule. Then. Yep. That's cool. Uh, the uh, Well, we were talking in our little pre-show meeting here that uh, he was a great aviator. He had a lot of kills in, in Korean War. Uh, and his wingman uh, during the Korean War was none other than who I think 
is the greatest baseball player of all time. And of course, you, do you would you would you agree with that, Mr. Thomas? Uh, Ted he's, Williams. He's among the best. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And in, in talking about uh, wingman for uh, for John Glenn in the Korean War, shooting down the enemy, and Ted Williams said John Glenn was ferocious and a great partner. Now, there were a couple of famous pictures of Glenn during the Korean conflict. One was he standing by his F-86, and the, the logo on the nose of the, of the airplane was the MiG Mad Marine, because okay. he did score several kills. But there's another picture of him standing alongside the stern of his aircraft after coming back from a mission, and the stern of the airplane is just shot to holes, just shot to ribbons. And he had taken a good deal amount of ground fire on this particular ground strike, and he picked up he picked up an unofficial nickname of Old Magnet Ass. Oh yeah, yeah. right, Old Magnet Ass. Right. Yes, uh, and uh, you know I think I saw a replay of that on one of these shows that have aviation battles and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. He didn't he didn't live that uh, that nickname very long there, but yeah. Teddy boy there, last man to bat 400. I think, I don't think anybody, did anybody bat 300 last year? I, I don't follow baseball like I used to, Nick. But uh, yes, a great, great baseball player. Spent the prime of his two years fighting mm -hmm. for our country, yeah. enlisted. Uh, Ted Williams, lo love to interject that a little bit. Well, Nick, here is the man in training. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, that you talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to talk about the periscope in the next yeah, this, slide there. This will give you an indication as to the small nature of that uh, mercury capsule. Now, this would be the capsule inside hangar S during the end-to-end uh, -end testing. And uh, actually, the, the, the photo is set up this way for, I suppose, clarity's sake. But actually, the, the photo could be uh, uh, turned 90 degrees to the left, and that would give you a better indication as to uh, what it was like in there. But this capsule will be hooked up to all the electrical systems and all the RF systems, make sure that everything worked properly and no one system interfered with another. So that was the nature of the end-to-end -end testing in there. I don't think they ever did any integrated SIMS there in, in there. I think that was left for uh, when the vehicle is out on the launch pad. Mm -hmm. But again, this gives you an, an idea of the cramped nature of that spacecraft. You're strapped tightly into that contour couch. And... When John Glenn said zero G and I feel fine, well, he could only feel it within him because he was strapped in so tightly. You certainly couldn't float around. You could feel your arms coming up, but um, uh, you're strapped in so tight. And a lot of people say that the reason we didn't really start hitting problems with space adaptation syndrome until Apollo was because Apollo was the first time that the crew actually had room to move around mm -hmm. and that certain disturbances between the... Uh, the eyesight and what was going on in the inner ear caused the onset of SAS, but you never really had that here in the uh, Mercury capsule. And in fact, one of the things, there were a lot of unknowns moving into this mission, particularly as far as the physiology of the astronaut was concerned. And one concern was what if the astronaut became nauseous and possibly vomit in the confines of that capsule or the, or the helmet. So the doctors came up with a medicine that could stave off nausea, and it was an injectable. Hmm. The problem was that the injectable had to go through that thick silverized suit and then right. into the astronaut's leg. So the engineers came up with a broad idea. They added a CO2 cartridge to that injector. And the idea was you took the cap off, you released the safety, and you hit yourself in the leg with that thing, and the CO2 would drive the needle through the suit and into your skin. Well, they explained this to John. They gave him one of the one of the injectors, and he took it up to crew quarters at hangar S, and he got a good, a large uh, Florida grapefruit, and he hit the grapefruit with that injector, and he said it was like shooting it with a twenty two caliber oh pistol. Oh my gosh! It... So what John did was he went to a pharmacy in Cocoa Beach and got himself a box of those Tigan tablets, and that's why he took up the nausea. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Wow. That's one of many uh, brilliant ideas that many of the. Uh, uh, Larry Lightbulb guys came up with it. Yeah, didn't work out so right, well. Larry Lightbulb yeah. guys. Well, uh, John Glenn goes, hey, 90-minute uh, orbit, 45 minutes in daylight, but I'm going to yeah. be in darkness for 45 minutes. You guys didn't put any lights in here. <laughs> and they're going, oh, yeah. So we have in our museum uh, case over there a prototype glove that has two yeah, little wheat batteries right. in the two fingers and a mm -hmm. nine volt battery cell there mm -hmm. and that's what he used to flip up and see the instrument panels 
one of my favorite things is the circular concave mirror there that yeah. was used to see the instrument panel while the movie was going on they, so they could see where the switches are. I've never seen one of those with my own eyes. They nicknamed Nick. they nicknamed that mirror the Hero Metal. Oh really? The sat Hero Metal. Just like yeah. some kind of a Hero Have you ever metal. seen one? Haven't seen one. I don't no. think there's one on Gus's suit. Uh, no, there there's might, not. There might, I don't think there's there not. is. He did have one because there are pictures of him with the um, yeah. mirror on his yeah. suit, but the suit that we have does not the, have the, it. That's a rare artifact. So, uh, Nick, uh, tell everyone what's between the legs of the astronaut here. Well, down at the bottom of the uh, con of the uh, control console, there is a uh, screen, a telescope screen. You had a telescope that extended through the hull of the spacecraft, and you looked in this circular screen about the size of a, a radar screen, mm -hmm. and you could see uh, the Earth as it was passing by. Now, the image was somewhat uh, warped because of the convex uh, uh, nature of the, of the periscope lens, but uh, you could adequately see the spacecraft motion, and if you worked real hard, you could look at it and judge the attitude of your spacecraft as to whether you were traveling of mm -hmm. whether or not you're traveling down what we'll call center line. Mm -hmm. But uh, the periscope was, uh, it was it was an extra added uh, uh, visual aid to the overhead window that John had there, the uh, um, trapezoidal window that Gus Grissom first tested on Liberty Bell 7. Mm -hmm. But the periscope would be extended while the vehicle was being checked out on the pad during the countdown. And sometimes sunlight would come in the periscope and you had to put on the filter or something. But that periscope was extended from the spacecraft until about 30 seconds before launch, and then it was retracted. So up till that time, John could look through that periscope and see anything that was going on outside in the white room. Well, during a training one day, he did look through that periscope, and here's what he saw, Nick. Yep. <laughs> this little uh, cartoon, it's you and me, John Baby, against, against the world. world. Yep. And who drew that artwork? I think that was done by Ceci Bibby. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, she, was, she was the artisan who came up with the logo of Friendship 7. And there that is right there. And if you remember, uh, for, Freedom so, uh, for Freedom 7 and Liberty Bell 7, there was just the stenciled, very uh, uh, atypical uh, uh, logo on the side of the spacecraft. But John had somehow learned about Ceci Bibby's ability, artistic ability, and talked to her about a distinctive design for his spacecraft. And from that time on, Ceci Bibby did all the Mercury capsules, uh, the design under the uh, under the window there. One of the kind of uh, hidden, another hidden figure of the space program. Yeah. Uh, uh, really. Well, she uh, did a lot of... Uh, paintings and stuff. I'd like to know more about her down the line. Yeah. Cecilia Bibby, that's B-E-B-E, mm -hmm. -E, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. On her name there. So a uh, little bit of space history there. There's John. Uh, many times he was up there in the uh, checkout room. So what's the history of this? This is just outside of Hangar S, obviously, after the mission. And President Kennedy came to the uh, to Cape Canaveral to uh, award John Glenn the, uh, I believe it was the uh, Ex Exceptional Service Medal. Uh, and after the ceremony that they had on the stand, John gave uh, the president a tour of the uh, spacecraft. And as I recall from talking to um, uh, President Kennedy's photographer, I'm trying to remember his name right now, but uh, he took a number of these pictures and he told me that the president was just in awe of the whole capsule, but shocked at the uh, amount or the lack of room inside that inside that spacecraft. So as we all are. Yeah. yeah, that's after the mission. We're going to see another colorful picture. There's President uh, LBJ, Vice President, mm -hmm. in the background there. Uh, see the scorched uh, 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 shingling there of the, uh, 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 what's the name of those shingles? I can't bring that up. Uh, the, uh, Iconel 7, uh, I think. Iconel, but there's another yeah. name for them there. Yeah. Uh, Marty might know. Well, uh, you know, the astronauts were famous for driving the Corvettes, uh, particularly the Apollo astronauts that Jim Rathman Indy 500 loaned them, leased them for a dollar a year. But uh, here's the man just in his nice little sedan there. Mm -hmm. This is just outside of the Mission Control Center at Cape Canaveral, where Mission Control was located until Gemini 4 in 1965. But uh, there you see uh, Glenn in his uh, not so spectacular sedan leaving uh, <laughs> leaving Mission Control. A lot of stories about the contrast between Glenn and his 
rather uh, uh, Spartan lifestyle, and the larger-than-life lifestyles of the other six fellows. Exactly. Yeah, called the Boy Scout of the, the original seven Mercury astronauts. He and Scott Carpenter. Yeah. Yep. But not all of them drew, drove a uh, Corvette. Some of them had some better taste, maybe. <laughs> well, Wally, Wally Sherrod drove a Maserati, which he dearly loved. And Scott Carpenter drove a, a Shelby Cobra, which oh, was a real race that's car. That's a good taste. And yeah. I had the chance to talk to Scott about that car. And years and years later, he still remembered that car and just said it was the best car he ever huh. drove. And what know? color it was? I don't know. Black I never, or never thought yeah, to, deep I blue. Knew, never thought to ask. I always ask the car colors there. Well, here is a, a classic photo. So glad you found oh, this, yeah. Nick. Boy, this is the history. Uh, there's three historic figures yeah. of our of our manned space program that uh, 61 years later, seven humans in an inter international space station living together. Yeah, this is up on the upper deck, and you didn't say second floor, you said the upper deck of Hangar S where we had the crew quarters and the medical uh, uh, checkout room. So who and, do we have here, Nick? Well, of course we have uh, John Glenn on the left, and in the center is the flight surgeon for the Mercury astronauts, for the Mercury program at that time, Dr. Bill Douglas, who was a, a remarkable man. And then to his right, we have our suit technician, Joe Schmidt. And Joe worked as a suit technician all the way through the Apollo program. So uh, mm -hmm. those that that passageway that you're looking at right there, I've been privileged to walk down that same passageway. And I can tell you that that passageway is even <laughs> narrower than that than that uh, photograph uh, mm. uh, uh, shows. It was just so tight down those. 61-year-old uh, uh, picture, of course, has probably been digitized a little bit, but that looks gorgeous. And just, shot. just behind uh, Bill Douglas and John would be the, quote, crew quarters, uh, which were decorated, uh, by the way, by uh, our friend Dee O'Hara. Oh, okay. Uh, she, Nurse. They were, painted a nice robin robin's egg blue and they had bunk beds inside and a couch and tv and so forth but yeah that's hanger us that's that's what it was like back in the mercury program it was very simple a very uh almost bare bones but it was the matter was to get the job done and get the mission flown absolutely and joe schmidt and bill douglas there uh yeah. they are actually pioneering this position yeah uh, just like Chris Kraft did as a flight director, they laid out the they laid out the whole uh, 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 blueprint for what those positions should be mm -hmm. and what they still are to this to this day. Little has changed, has yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, in there. Well, this is a, just the other day you took this picture to share with us. Yeah, this is a couple of weeks ago. This is out at Pad 14 as it is today, and the sky was just so beautiful that day that it the. The pictures practically took themselves. Yeah. But this picture you see is of the uh, uh, front gate uh, to uh, pad 14, and to the left you can see just a part of the blockhouse for the launch pad. Yeah, we'll see a couple more photos mm -hmm. of that as we look at the, one of the days. Uh, John Glenn, this, this mission was originally scheduled in December 1961, had mm -hmm. three or four delays there. Uh, not sure if that was... I don't think they were Atlas problems. I think problems. The, the, I think the, the communication. The total, or... the total number of delays for uh, uh, hardware and for weather numbered uh, eleven. Yeah, total he was going to go delays, to, uh, right. like January twentieth and twenty seventh, yep. yeah. and finally, and February fourteenth was an, uh, Valentine's Day was another schedule. And when you talk to John Glenn about that, boy, were you upset? Were you unnerved by all these delays? He said, "No." He says. I found myself having to buck up everybody around me because they were all shook up. But, yeah. of course, being a test pilot, you pace yourself emotionally into such a degree that you're ready for these things, even if they happen at the last second, and you're ready to recover from them and make the next attempt. And that was where that was where I think John Glenn uh, acquired that reputation of being the steely-eyed Marine because he was able to suck it up. And, uh, and work past all these delays and all these problems to fly a, a remarkably successful flight. I mean, he had to be aware of the infamy that was going to be at the end of this mission. Strangely, so. strangely in talking to him, he was not. Oh, uh, really? Like the Apollo 13 crew, he told me that when he came back home and saw all this, I don't know, adulation or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, the newspapers and the media and so forth, he was very much taken by surprise. Because frankly, he didn't have time to think about you know future laurels and 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 uh, ticker tape parades. He had his head in the mission completely, 
And so subsequently, as I say, just like the Apollo 13 crew, he said he came back home and he was just overwhelmed by all this. We're going to see a parade picture here it's, in a minute. It, it's just like the Apollo 13 crew said one yeah. night on the Tonight Show. I said, you know, we lit, we missed the whole thing. We were busy doing things. Right. We missed all the drama. We were too busy trying to stay alive. Yeah, they didn't know the whole world was praying for them yeah. like they were. So we got a great man here, two great men. Yeah, yeah. There's Gunther Rent on the right, and Gunther was the bad leader. Uh, throughout Project Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. Uh, there's a famous picture on Apollo 14 when Alan Shepard is get, about to get ready on board to get on board the Apollo command module, and Gunther hands him a cane, calling it the astronaut mobility device or whatever, <laughs> because, of course, Al was, was 47 at the time of that flight. Yeah. But Gunther had a great way of keeping... He, he was he was a hard-nosed disciplinarian. He watched everything that went on in that white room, and he kept track of everything and was was almost dictatorial. They called him the bad Fuhrer, and mm -hmm. he didn't object to that. But at the same time, he was able to lighten up, able to lighten the mood and keep everybody loose, as you see here during one of many scrubs for, for Glenn's flight. And it's basically, you know, hey, hang in there, John. We'll do it again next time. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, and so we did. And uh, he, he was a great friend of our museum also, yeah. also a consultant on Apollo 13. Yeah, a remarkable guy. And yeah. uh, lived around here and just a, a good luck in, charm in, in many ways for the astronauts. In the do not the documentary, the miniseries, From the Earth to the Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember the actor's name who played Gunther Went in the series. But Gunther was so proud. <clears throat> because this actor who played him in the miniseries had a Shakespearean background. Oh. And Gunther would say they had to get a Shakespearean actor <laughs> to portray me, which was true. <laughs> well, quite a character. He wrote a good book, too. Yeah. Uh, name of that book, is it over in my library there? Uh, somebody will probably The Unbroken Chain. The Unbroken Chain. Right. Very, very, one of the, the, the classics of the, probably one of the top 20 books you should all read. Well, there's the launch, the fire, the flame. Uh, famous picture there, the yeah. famous Atlas rocket that over 350 of those first stages are laying over the Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. after launching hundreds and hundreds of satellites, mostly with a Centaur second stage. And a vehicle that had a lot of, of a, a very problematic history when, when it was being man-rated. Uh, several explosions of, the, of that vehicle on the pad and uh, in early flight. And... Uh, that was on everybody's mind when this uh, mission came up. Uh, I don't think it would have been on Glenn's mind because he was that disciplined. But for all of us who had seen these explosions on the uh, on the Cape time after time, there was a constant worry that we had a very dangerous boost phase to get past before we could even start breathing again. I believe Scott Carpenter, after Glenn's mission, watched one blow up uh, before, but, uh, before his flight. Well, there was a famous famous explosion that it was a night launch of an atlas out at pad 14 and all the mercury astronauts were out there and this thing took off and everybody came out of the blockhouse and watched this vehicle taking off into the night sky big beautiful red flame going uphill it just it just almost like a movie production and this thing goes up higher and higher and higher and it gets to the high cube point and instead of going through it it blew great big red fireball in the night sky and there was kind of a silence among everybody standing outside the blockhouse looking at this thing as it fell apart and it was gordon cooper who stepped up and said well at least they got that one out of the way <laughs> yes so well it's kind of true well your time's up your time's up well here's a couple other pretty pictures you took out uh, the way this uh, pad 14 looks today as yes, the, the actual uh, primary access road leading out to the pad you can see the pad out there uh the ramp uh, access ramp would be to the right, but just hidden by the, the foliage there. But uh, all that remains are the uh, remnants of that uh, ramp. The tower and such are, uh, are long gone, of course. And in this picture, uh, you've got a view of the blockhouse and the support building behind it. And that blockhouse was where the countdown took place. And then after the vehicle left the pad, control was turned over to Mission Control over on the other side of Cape Canaveral. A blockhouse like you wouldn't believe. It's 700 yeah. feet away from yeah. the launch. Yeah. And I asked why so close to these old timers. And they go, Mark, electricity will only conduct yeah. down a, a copper line uh, 700, 800 feet in, the the, longer, in those days. The longer your electrical lines, the more ratty uh, 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 signal you're going to be getting. So... Uh, they were limited by that uh, as far as distance is concerned. And, of course, today with the uh, uh, different modes of communication, microwave and so forth, our 
uh, launch control t- uh, uh, building is now about three and a half, four miles away yeah. from the launch pad. But we couldn't do that in those days. Well, they're in this, uh, like Nick said, uh, as tight as those uh, Daytona drivers were in your hometown yeah. over the weekend. Right. And they're hardly able to move. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he had a few things floating in front of him there. Uh, thank you for sharing these beautiful pictures. You know, this, like this, they... this picture reminds me of one of the many suggestions that I said earlier that was made by some of the uh, <laughs> bright engineers. Uh, one of the guys said that Glenn should be, during the flight, that Glenn should blindfold himself and reach out and try to touch certain switches on the control panel. He said, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> no. And then another engineer suggested that Glenn put the capsule into a multi-axis tumble to see if he could recover from it. Oh my God. And John's reply was, let me get this straight. You're going to put me into an emergency condition to see if I can get out of an emergency condition? No, we're not going to do that Jeez. either. But of course, you know, you had this first flight, you had a lot of people who who just didn't know what to expect up there. They had some very wild uh, 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 ideas about uh, how to uh, learn these things up in space. But you had to, at some point, you had to be disciplinary enough to say, no, let's focus on the mission, what we're trying to try and test the spacecraft and the systems, and let's leave all this other jazz for another day. Absolutely. You had to, uh, we did not know if you could uh, blink for uh, two hours in space. We did know. If you could make saliva if you. Didn't know if you could uh, swallow when you're in he, uh, zero uh, gravity. For what Didn't John Glenn yeah. eat something in space? He ate some applesauce, uh, which was admittedly, it was like something that. toothpaste. It's something right that there. could make, make its way through the digestive system, but it wasn't solid in such a way that it could possibly get hung up. So they didn't want to take a chance on that. Yeah. But he successfully ate the applesauce and uh, proved that peristalsis, which is what we use here on Earth, the muscles contracting through the digestive system to carry the food down, peristalsis works in zero gravity the way that it does That was important, Earth. yeah. Peristalsis? Yeah. What yeah. a smart man. That's interesting. And a yeah. lot of people, of course, were saying, you know, could you eat or drink in a zero gravity condition? And like one of the astronauts said, well, you know, get on a set of monkey bars, hang upside down and eat a hamburger. You'll see it all digest properly. And I always say that any spring breaker knows that you can drink standing on your head, so that's nothing new. We were that's doing right. we were doing that in St. Petersburg a, little, a long time ago. A little bear pong upside <laughs> yeah. down, yeah, maybe yeah, in there. Yeah. Well, here's one of the most famous National Geographic yeah. covers, uh, an artwork by Mr. Paul Cowley. Chris yeah. Cowley is his son and a friend of our museum. Yeah, uh, the fireball. Oh God, and. The thought of surviving that reentry was something that was just so foreign to us because for the first two flights, the suborbital flights, your reentry was fairly brief, but it did exert something on the order of 11 Gs. So the complication here, of course, as you can see in that uh, representation, the retro pack is still strapped to the heat shield. Mm-hmm. And they had to keep that retro pack on because they had what proved to be an erroneous signal indicating that the heat shield had come loose. It was a, um, trying to remember the name of segment 51. That indicated the heat shield might be loose. So during the second orbit, John was getting a lot of questions from the ground stations like, do you hear any banging or noises when you're in high rates or uh, maneuvering the spacecraft at all? And he said, no. He said, and then at one point they asked him to take the retro jettison switch from off to auto and then turn it back off again. And John's thinking, uh, something's going on here. And playing around with the switches like this could possibly make it worse. Mm-hmm. So he took the, uh, I, it was the landing bag switch, I should say. He took the landing bag switch from off to auto, got no light, switched it back to off. So that was okay. So they finally told him um, uh, on the third orbit to, um, after retrofire, to prepare for an important message from the Cape. And when he passed over the Cape, Alan Shepard informed him we've got a signal here that your heat shield might be loose. We want you to keep the retro pack on. We don't think that we'll have any difficulty with reentry in that mode. And he says, okay. So he reentered with the retro pack on, and there were a lot of concerns about that. Would that retro pack possibly throw the capsule out of attitude and cause it to burn up? Was it possible that maybe even a fist size of a solid propellant in those retros had not burned, and could that possibly explode during the reentry and cause the damage that we were afraid might have already happened? So making that reentry in that mode was no small feat, and John reported during the uh, uh, after the reentry that he could see great chunks of that retro pack coming over the window, and he couldn't be sure at that time if it was a retro pack or the heat shield that was tearing up. 
So obviously that was a very, very nervous time. But when I look at that picture, I think of the genius of Max Faget, who designed that capsule, and the inherent stability that he designed into mm -hmm. that capsule. And uh, Scott Carpenter especially found that out when he re-entered with empty fuel tanks. Even though the capsule was vibrating from side to side during that re-entry, it stayed on track and it stayed relatively stable and came through the re-entry quite well. So again, hats off to Max Faget right. and that design of his. Exactly. Was it uh, turning? Did it have a rotating yeah, you had, uh, when turn? You, was it coming when you in got, to balance out? The... When the spacecraft sensed 05G, which was 0.5, uh, uh, one half, uh, 0.5 of a G, the cats would go into a small one degree per second roll program, uh, much like a bullet would exiting the rifle uh, barrel to keep it stable. Yes. You, you spin anything to keep it stable. Gotcha. And that was the idea behind the 05G maneuver. And as a result of this, uh, uh, keeping the retro pack on, John had to do the reentry manually and override the 05G switch and then control the spacecraft in uh, fly by wire during the reentry. So, coming through with that uh, uh, retro pack on caused a, a great number of changes in the procedures that he had to effectuate during that reentry. And of course, he did a great job there. Yeah. Looking at the ship that picked him up was uh, that's the a Noah. Good trivia. As I said, that's a good uh, trivia question. Now, there. th there's also I knew you'd know it. The there's, Noah was the ship. There's also up. some controversy. Four hour, four hour flight, three orbits. There's also some controversy about that. Now, the Noah yeah. was a destroyer that was attached to the USS Randolph, the aircraft carrier that was supposed to to pick John up. But as fate would have it, John landed closer to the Noah than he did to the uh, Randolph. And so the Noah made the recovery. Now, there are sailors who were on board the uh, Randolph who accused the Noah of basically cutting them off to get to oh, really? first. And Jeez. that's been an ongoing controversy between uh, crew members of the Noah and crew members of the Randolph at that wow. time. <laughs> but we're talking with Nick Thomas, always enjoying great conversations with him, awesome stories. Uh, the depth of Nick's knowledge is just impeccable in many ways. Uh, it's always uh, pleasurable to be around someone that knows a little bit of stuff about this. But when you know a lot and and uh, can challenge each other with the knowledge, it's a lot of fun, Nick. And, uh, you know, I, the moon days, moonwalk day should be a national holiday, February 20th. Uh, though it is a holiday today, President's Day. Uh, a day in the hearts of all space geeks out there, February 20th, 1962, John Glenn's three orbits of the Earth, the first American to do that, uh, and uh, really was the inspiration uh, for our whole country to realize, hey, we're really going to do this. We're, we're really going to put people around the orbit because the first two, of course, Al, Al Shepard and Gus Grissom, just 15 minutes over by Bermuda landed. Uh, this was a bigger deal going around the entire and you, world. And, you know, originally in Project Mercury, it was thought that all seven astronauts would fly a Redstone flight before we moved mm -hmm. to the Atlas flights. However, after um, German Titov uh, was up in orbit for over a day, NASA decided that it was time to accelerate the orbital program and move on to the Atlas uh, rocket. And the, ast the astronauts all agreed with that. They, even Alan Shepard said, you know, you only need two of those suborbital flights. Yeah, let's press on, let's let's get into the orbital program, which we did. And then uh, Scott Carpenter repeated uh, yeah. the three orbits, Wally Sherrod doubled it to six, and mm -hmm. then uh, Gordon Cooper spent a whole day and a half yeah. in space there. So here's the festivities on- uh, Hangar S. Uh, was this in the afternoon? The launch was in the morning? Uh, no, this was well after, the, this, was, this was well after the mission, I think okay. at least a week after the mission. And President Kennedy came to Cape Canaveral to award John the, I think it was the ESM, the Exceptional President Service. President Kennedy's at the podium there. James yeah. Webb's behind him. And he was awarding what are John Glenn. those two Glennie. capsules there? Those two capsules you're looking at there, uh, over there in the background, the charred, beat-up capsule. That's Friendship 7. That's John's capsule. But in the foreground is a Mercury capsule known as Delta 7. Now, this was going to be flown by astronaut Deke Slayton. Deke was originally scheduled to follow John on another three-orbit flight. And uh, Deke had already named his capsule uh, Delta-7. And in fact, uh, he even did a stand-up interview in front of that spacecraft after these festivities were over, saying that uh, he's always glad to see a spacecraft, but he wished it was inside from the elements. <laughs> of course, later on, because of, uh, of uh, heart problems, Deke was uh, grounded, and Scott Carpenter eventually took that flight instead. 
It says manned spacecraft center. Yeah, right. There, of course, we would now try to say crewed spacecraft or human can, or but, whatever or the human, but, people are telling um, us to so say these days. Cape Canaveral is actually the manned spacecraft center. Well, this was the uh, name that they'd taken upon themselves, and I think understandably so. Uh, but later on, that name was associated with the uh, uh, control center in Houston, Texas, when they took over for Gemini 4 in 1965. And that, and then it was known as the – Houston was simply known as the MSC, the Manned Spacecraft Center. After Lyndon Johnson's death, it was renamed the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center. Beautiful festivities there, uh, dignitaries, uh, you know, uh, just uh... – uh, this was all new, too, by the way, of how to present uh, the president, the astronauts. Uh, I'm sure this was a, you know. Very unique. Uh, this was the only such ceremony performed at Cape Canaveral. Thereafter, the astronauts coming home would travel to the White House, and a ceremony would take place in the Rose Garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a gorgeous picture there. And then here is, of course. Washington, D.C., and the... Um, I believe Capitol that's Washington, building in the back. Yeah. Yep, Capitol in the background there. And, and very rainy those. day, and uh, John Glenn and his wife Annie, and to the left in the raincoat seat, seated in the back of the car is Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he, uh, yep, that, that's, uh, and millions of people turned out even in the rain. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There. Of course, I showed you we've got the button that launched this, the, there. We're very proud of that in our museum. Uh, close up of the button there. They actually got a misprint on the plaque. It says MA7. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's, uh, uh, the reference to MA7 on the brass plaque is an error made at the time of engraving. Mm -hmm. was, of course, MA6. And you know who corrected right. that for us? No. John Tribe. Hey, yeah, John uh, Tribe. Outstanding. Rockwell uh, yeah. uh, uh, gentleman there. Great yeah. guy, John Tribe. I corrected that. He knew T.J. O'Malley pretty well. And again, a lot of stories about T.J. O'Malley. We could do a whole show yes, on him. Yes, we will one day. <laughs> we have to. Uh, you could do it on him and Rocco Patron yep. uh, on there. And of course, we're proud to have John Glenn's hard hat. And, and you know, Nick, the provenances of our items in our museum are so important. Right. Our collection manager, Nick uh, Enix, is uh, just stellar at that. And uh so it's always great to have a picture of him wearing the hard hat, though, right. to show it was him. Uh, one story that is told around here is that when they just about had John Glenn ready to autograph that, Glenn was whisked away, uh, and uh, uh, there was a little resentment that they didn't get him to autograph that at uh, the time there, yeah. which you know how that is when oh, yeah. people Absolutely. have times on there. Yeah. So, um, But he did go to space again, of course, and that was in 1999, was it? Uh, SCS-95 SCS, SCS in 1998. 98, yeah. okay, yeah. And uh, what a big hoopla that was, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurt Brown was the commander. Uh, and uh, Scott Parazinski was uh, the, the MD on board, and he was basically assigned to be John's MD, his overseer during that right. flight. So it's like, okay, Scott, you are going to take care of John Glenn in space. Don't think that wasn't a responsibility. Yeah, October 98. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, all kinds of precautions there. He actually had electro uh, trodes outside of his space suit if I could start his heart and all that kind of and, stuff. And, you know, Scott being uh, 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 John's uh, medical officer and Scott having spent time with us over at Astronaut Encounter, he told me time and again what a personable and down-to-earth guy John was. And the first thing he said in the first crew meeting he attended was, call me John. Oh, he really? Said, no senator, no, it's just John. He says, I'm just part of the crew. And Scott said he carried on that particular uh, attitude, if you will, throughout the entire flight. He was just a member of the crew and damn happy to be one. And uh, had a very serious flight. Here he is all rigged up doing experiments on aging and, and the, the flow of of. of, of foods in our body. The, the doctors had a field day because this was a chance to find out the effects of someone, uh, an older uh, person flying in space, and more importantly, a person who had flown in space prior to this. So they could balance this data that they were getting with data that was taken from Friendship 7 and hopefully learn more about uh, what happens with uh, with older people uh, in space flight. And to the best of my, uh, the best of my knowledge, that research is still going on. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And because John Glenn had a physical 
every year, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. The astronauts, you know that, they all go out to Houston yep. uh, about uh, in January or something, I think, and get a free physical. But they had this database of yeah. him uh, and, uh, you know, still research papers and so forth being written about this flight. And John years, was a decades later. John was in incredibly good shape. If we go back to that picture sure. of him suited up in the pressure suit one more back. Uh -huh. Okay. Now take a look at that pressure suit. Now one of the things you had to do in that pressure suit during your training was to do water egress or water uh, uh, survival training in the big pool out at uh, Johnson. So one day, as I was told by another astronaut, two crews were out there doing their water training. Now on one crew was a Russian cosmonaut who was probably heavier than he should have been and not <laughs> in the kind of shape that you'd want to be in space yeah. flight. Well, he's doing his water egress training, and John is at the same time. Now, part of the egress training, you're in the water, your neck dam is sealed around your neck, so you're buoyant in that suit, and you have to get into your survival raft. And the Russian cosmonaut, he tried, and he struggled, and he clawed, and he grabbed. He couldn't get into his, his uh, life raft. Well, this astronaut who was witnessing this told me that John kicked up his right foot, and in one move, was right inside that life raft. Marine. He was a marine, absolutely. Ooh, one yeah, for the one for the one for the core. That's right. One, one for, for the, the core. core. Right. Semper Fi there. Yeah. I believe that. I'm gonna ask you who that Russian was after the show. Yeah, here. we'll talk I about know, that later. I know, I know, <laughs> we'll dis uh, we'll discuss personalities uh, afterwards. <laughs> uh, John Glenn, I mean, you know, just like I grew up in Ohio and and uh, of course uh, uh, native of, of Ohio, a tremendous hero. Uh, just, I mean, you and me, just kind of kindred spirits growing up with this, Nick. Yeah. Uh, where can we see Friendship 7? Well, Friendship 7 is currently in Washington, D.C. at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, I think it might be in the Udfar Hazi over at uh, yes, Dallas. Yes, I think they moved yeah. it over there. And uh, even looking at that spacecraft today, it just takes your breath away to think of the not only the ingenuity and the incredible science and engineering going on here, but the simple pure, raw courage involved in this mission. Not just the astronaut, but also the ground crew, the mission control crew, the launch team, everyone involved in this mission. Because you had a man on top of that Atlas rocket that, as I say, had been blowing up left and right over on the Cape over the past couple of years. And everyone, certainly on the ground crew and in the uh, support team, certainly had that in the back of their mind. I think the only person who wasn't perturbed by that history was John Glenn himself. He was just too busy, you know, focused on the mission. But uh, this was, I think, the best example of raw American ingenuity and courage. And also, most importantly on this flight, this flight was covered from start to finish in real time on radio and on television, and that was broadcast all over the world. Now, the Soviet missions at that time were draped in deep, dark secrecy. The Soviets never said anything about their flights, except that the, the launch was successful, the recovery was good, and the cosmonaut was safe. And that's all they were mm -hmm. saying. But these missions were shown from start to finish in real time. And the whole world was in on this, for better or for worse, no matter what happened. And I think that fact was what captured the imagination of the world in a way the Russian flights never could, because all of our flights were out in the open in real time. Absolutely. For the whole world. Great point there, Nick. Yeah. And uh, because the Russians were so secretive, they didn't uh, share things with us that uh, we could have benefited from much, like, much difficult space walks. Much, were, the same as, much the same as the Chinese are today. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, well, like I was saying, I uh, grew up in Ohio and uh, John Glenn, of course, a great uh, 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 inspiration to me. And I become a photographer for the Associated Press, putting myself through Ohio State and uh, go Buckeyes and photographed John Glenn at many a press conference. But what was odd was what 61 years ago, Nick, uh, I'm eight years old my and my family lived in uh, Winter Park for just a year. And on 61 years ago today, I woke up with the mumps <laughs> And second grade, went outside with my mom to look at the, the rocket go up yeah. and thought, oh, man, I'm going to see this the rest of my life. I never saw another rocket launch for about 55 years until I came here and moved here 55 years ago. But I uh, had my encounters with John Glenn. In fact, I said I saw that launch uh, of yours. And uh, I know you've heard it a thousand times. 
uh, another picture I took of him. No, we'll go back there. Uh, I know you've heard it a thousand times. Uh, he said more like a hundred thousand times. And I said, well, I woke up with the mumps as a kid. And this wonderful man looked at me, Nick, and he said, better you than me wake Absolutely. up with the mumps. Uh, what what a brilliant man uh, uh, in a sense of, of, of people, people handling skills, just paramount. And uh, I love him to death. I was so privileged to know him. We lost him about five years ago at age 95. Of course, he was a senator for over 25 years. And, uh, you know, just... I, I, my number one hero yeah. uh, out, you know, outside of sports guys, but still he's, he's number one over his, Mickey Mantle to me. <laughs> his, his name, his name was on the lips of every schoolboy for years to come after that mission. Because when you spoke about America and you spoke about astronauts, the name John Glenn was the first to, to come to your mind. Um, the fact of what he had accomplished, which was so daring to begin with, and then the dangers that he faced during the mission with that, potentially lose mm -hmm. uh, heat shield. That, as I say, uh, uh, stood in stark contrast to anything that we'd ever heard of the, the Russians because we've heard virtually nothing of what the Soviets were doing. But here was an American, a Marine, and a gentleman who had gone through that and come through it with his, with his bravery and his courage. And he was that kind of an inspiration to every young schoolboy uh, as I was growing up uh, in Daytona Beach, Florida. Well, he was, and personally, as you know, Nick, a very real person, very yeah. caring. You, he, he commanded the room, but you felt like he was, he was, he was just talking to you. Tell you a funny story about John Glenn and Al Shepard coming to an, uh, an event one day. Uh, they both came in at the same time, and all of us were in the room waiting for them. Now, remember, John at the time is a sitting United States senator. Well, they both come at the same time, and right away, Al Shepard starts working the room, shaking hands. Hi, Al Shepard, nice to see you. Big smile, big grinning, uh, big grinning face. And John, U.S. Senator, just sitting in the back of the room, just content to, okay, this is Al Sling. He does this well. I'll wave him through it, and he did. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I can remember at one time, we were walking through the exhibits here in the, uh, 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 in the hall, and... Al leaned over and he whispered something to John, and I didn't hear what it was, but John just turned beet red. I don't know what Al said to him, but he just turned beet red. And how Al, Al had that way of just tweaking John from time to time, just uh, one uh -huh. way or another, uh, getting his attention. Uh, let's say. Another gotcha there. Another gotcha, no gotcha yeah. there. Well, you, you've been real privileged to be around these Mercury guys and so forth, and uh, we love your stories. There, we've got uh, Marty. We've got some wonderful people watching today. Nick Roberts is watching. Ophelia Sautrell's in France. Dave Stangy's up in Michigan. He's going to come down in a couple of weeks, Marty. We were talking about that. Uh, Tom Usiak's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. His brother Mark's headed down here, so uh, I guess I'll be eating at Zarella's oh, for yeah, the rest right. of the week there, which is no problem there. We love John Zarella's place. Uh, who else we got? Yeah, who's else watching us? Oh, well, let's Nick? see. Uh, Dano is at Demano. Uh, Lisa Marie and Tom. Uh, Celentano. Celentano. Okay, yeah. Cliff Watson's in Norman. Uh, no, he's in Pomona, Australia. Cliff, you're already into Tuesday there, having a brekkie. I hope watching. Stay curious. Uh, ben Hewitt, Hazel Banks. Uh, thank you for watching, Hayes. Uh, Cynthia Rossi, Bill Whit Whiting's watching, Carlton Bailey, Gary Gerald, uh, Zubin's watching, Christopher Mick, he's an educator in um, uh, Wisconsin, and Steve Hammer. And we are all so happy that you're with us to stay curious today. I would Thank like you. to say hello to some friends of mine who will be watching in later on this evening. My wife, Laura, her friend, Mary. Uh, Ken Cameron, Wendy Lawrence, and uh, Valerie Egan, and my brother Michael. So, uh, howdy to all of you. Well, as usual, I think uh, your brother did a great job today. We love your stories there, and uh, uh, glad that your family's in there, and a couple astronauts there, Marty. And we, you know, I just got to say, Nick does such a fabulous job out there uh, uh, introducing the astronauts, uh, as well as uh, fielding that bathroom question for the 10,000th time with like it was the first time you ever heard how did an astronaut go to a bathroom from a eight-year-old little girl you know uh, but uh, this is an experience folks that uh, you know there's a window for it Nick 
uh, I mean, 30 years from now, I don't know if they'll be doing this. You know, you never know. But uh, it's, it's happening now. And I always say over 300 American astronauts are in our communities doing great things 40 times a year. Uh, different ones out there, at least uh, giving their talk. And it's just, mm -hmm. uh, you do such a great job out there, Nick. Thank you. Well, it's it's, it's a privilege to be able to uh, spend time with these men and women, to learn the history that's not in the history books, and to uh, be able to share stories with one another and to uh, watch the interaction between the astronauts and the public because it's always fascinating. Uh, you will have the same sense of awe and inspiration from a 60 year old that you will from a 10 year old i mean it just goes across all yes, age lines that's true yes yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and even people over 60 uh in there so uh I'm getting there yeah we're getting it, yeah it gets there so uh enjoyed having nick here reliving stories about the great uh john glenn on this 61st anniversary of hers his first flight there uh uh, did I mention that we have his hard hat in the yes, museum that's all here? That. Yeah, we certainly do. Uh, uh, what to take us out, Nick? Two Buckeyes, in my opinion, in history, were just so perfectly chosen for their role: John Glenn and Neil Armstrong. It's true, but if you look across the history of aviation, and for that matter, the history of exploration. You'll find out that here in the United States, we have been blessed with having the right person in the right place at the right time. That certainly starts out with, um, let us say, uh, Charles Lindbergh, mm -hmm. moving on to Al Shepard, to John Glenn, and then in later years to uh, Neil Armstrong, to um, uh, Eileen Collins. Absolutely. And to our, what I'll call our recovery astronauts, Eileen Collins and uh, Rick Houck, right. people who stepped forward when they were the, needed the most and were ready to accept that challenge. And more importantly, to accept it with what I call, <clears throat> what I call a becoming grace, uh, particularly in the case of Neil Armstrong. Neil is the uh, exemplar of what you want your heroes to be. Um, he didn't talk much, but when he did, it carried a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. He was not at all self-aggrandizing. Uh, he was a very modest man. Um, and much as uh, P. Conrad would have said, uh, flying in space is something I did. It's not who I am. So I think, as I say, throughout history, we've been blessed with these men and women who've come forward at the right time to step forward and do an incredible job, an incredibly courageous job. And I think that speaks volumes about the quality of uh, the American in the 20th and 21st century. Well said, Nick. I appreciate your insight into that. Uh, a wise man once said nothing. Yeah. And uh, I think some of us can relate to that. Well, we got a big week here on the Space Coast. We're going to launch Crew 6, four more astronauts going up to the space station. Uh, is that uh, two o three in the morning, Saturday morning, or Sunday, or Friday morning? I believe it's going yeah. to be Friday morning, but I have to go yeah. back check. We having, will. Having, you'll, you'll having clock been, in. Having been on vacation, <laughs> yeah. I haven't been too close to things. This week. And we appreciate. Yeah, and I know you recharge your batteries, <laughs> yeah. ready to go out there and do your thing, and you uh, we'll be out there. Who's out there? Uh, the Canadian astronaut Thirst. Uh, let's see, Bob Thirst is going to be with us uh, starting tomorrow, and okay. Bob is a fascinating guy. You need to come and hear Bob, and if you get a chance to ask questions, take advantage of the fact that Bob is a medical doctor, and he's got some incredible insights as to the medical side of all this. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, get into a discussion with him regarding the ocular problems that we're seeing on long oh, duration space flight because he has got some very important insights into that and oh. bob is just a remarkable guy he's a lot of fun and he's uh he's he's just always you're always learning something new from him yeah you've told me about him before probably be out there thursday on, he's, on do that mm -hmm, but uh, yeah big week here you're going to be busy we're going to be busy at the american space museum we know some of our friends that are you on stay curious will find us here you're welcome to come down uh, of course, we're not open on Sunday, but 10 to 5. Uh, we're looking good here. We got new carpet. Uh, exhibits are all buffed up. So uh, we're proud of what we have here to share with all of you out there. So uh, Nick Thomas, thank you for another great program. Marty, we've got anything to clean up on our Streamlabs production today. Nope, we're good.
All right. Thanks, Marty. So, uh, like I said, a big week. We're going to talk tomorrow about shuttles of the month of February, 11 shuttles launched, mm -hmm. all five orbiters yep. orbited the Earth in the month of February. So we'll talk about a few of those and talk about the Crew-6 going up to the space station. And, you know, once they get up there this weekend, we're going to tie the record for the, record the most humans up there, right? in space. One time. There will be 11 on the ISS mm -hmm. and three on the Soviet or the Chinese Tangong, mm -hmm. tying again 14 is the most humans have ever orbited the Earth right. at one time. Mm -hmm. Seems like it could be more, but it's not, Nick. So. Everything takes time. Everything takes time. Well, thank you, sir, okay. for exemplary time here of staying curious. And, and I'm Mark Marquette saying until we see you again, stay curious to bridge the space between us.